Brothers and sisters, it is great to be back with another teaching video here, and I've invited my good friend and brother, Brother Peter Sander, for this, I think now, fifth, it's either the fourth or fifth session or video that I've done in response to a video that was sent to me by a um, Christian man named R.L. Solberg, who has written a book called Torahism, I have found out, and also who put forth a video about Jesus transposing the Torah. Now, if this is the first video that you have watched in this series, I would encourage you to go back and watch the previous four where I go over the first, I think, seven minutes or so of Mr. Solberg's uh, video. But I asked my friend and brother Peter to come on here, and we're going to be touching on some things on the Sermon on the Mount today, which is one of my favorite texts in the uh, New Testament, as it's commonly called. And the reason I asked Peter is because every time that I talk to him or listen to him talk, I learn something. And so I like to be learning, and I like to be challenged uh, when people talk. I don't like to be in the room where everybody agrees or everybody thinks the exact same way. I like to be able to uh, to think and, and, like I said, be challenged. And so Peter has a unique approach being an observant Jewish man um, who has uh, an extremely extensive background and, and study in the, in the New Testament. And so I'm thankful for Brother Peter. Thank you, Matthew, for having me. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no problem, man, no problem. So where I had gotten up to in Solberg's video, um, the last video I did where he talked about um, rituals versus the heart, and he came across in the video as though this is a, this is something that is like intrinsic and, and brand new in Yeshua's teaching um, in the Gospels and how that Yeshua made it all about the heart when it used to just be all about just going through the motions of these rituals and, and all of that. And I tried to show how that rituals are just basically means a divine right or, or ceremony. And that in the, in the older covenant in the Hebrew scriptures, that a ritual is a ritual that the almighty gives to his people is a, is a beautiful thing. And that the ritual has never meant that it wasn't, about the heart. And I think this is something that, that Christians tend to think, you know, I, I just talked with somebody yesterday and they said, when I just shared a little bit about Torah with them, they said, well, you know, I'm just so glad that Jesus came and died so that we don't have to do all those things anymore. And, you know, I do my best, Peter, I do my best not to get frustrated with, with folks. Um, and I didn't thankfully, but you know, I think I just close my eyes. I take a deep breath. I think we have to go all the way back <laughs> to square one here because that is such a bad way of viewing um, why Yeshua came and a bad way of viewing Hebrew scripture and a bad way of viewing the instructions from the Almighty. You know, I know it's fascinating in, in the West and Western religions, especially that the, those that branch off of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, there, there tends to be a heavy focus on uh, this dualism uh, between this dichotomy, the separation between spirit, like what's in the mind, right, yeah. and, and body, what you do in your, in your flesh, right? And this, this separation is, is really, it's fundamentally antithetical to the entire purpose of what creation was for. <laughs> creation from the beginning was meant to be the dwelling for the Almighty, uh, you know, to dwell within the physical creation, to be to be present, to commune with humanity, uh, all within physical parameters, and that's why we affirm a belief in the resurrection of the dead. Uh, we don't think that you know souls go to an eternal, immaterial existence. They, yeah. we humans are ultimately reconciled to the Almighty within bodily form. Our bodies matter, right? And so there's this cultural tendency, and especially in Western religions and with Christianity, and it impacts all Western religions within the West here. It impacts Judaism and Islam as well, too. It's this tendency to separate, you know, the spirit, thought, mind from, from matter. And it just it creates this really artificial dichotomy. I know that you've heard the analogy and you probably used it, 
you can't tell your wife, well, I'm faithful to you in my heart, but then physically not be faithful to your wife, right? Um, and th this way of thinking is really germane to the Protestant traditions. And yes. um, it is interesting to note that within the sacramental traditions, like Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy, there's more of, a, 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 of an emphasis on the merger of spirit and matter, right? And uh, Solberg, as a Christian theologian, uh, would do well to learn more from that aspect of that part of the of the Christian tradition, the emphasis there on how ritual and, and, and matter can, can go together and that we don't need to uh, create an artificial dichotomy between ritual and ethics even. We're going to go here very soon, but that's one of the fundamental cries of the prophets, the Hebrew prophets, is to uh, maintain ritual with justice, mm -hmm. ritual with compassion, with chesed, you know, and that's, that's all really, really fundamental. When you're talking about that, it reminds me of Isaiah chapter one. Isaiah chapter one, if I'm not mistaken, is um, a rebuke on the house of Israel, the northern kingdom. And Yahweh says, an ox knows his owner and a donkey, uh, his master but my people do not know my ways. And he goes in and he talks about how that they're spreading their hands forth in prayer, but he's not going to listen. He even uses some really staunch language like, um, I hate your new moons. I hate your Sabbaths um, away with your convocations. Um, I'm not going to show up at them when you offer incense to me. Um, I'm not going to smell the incense. Uh, and a lot of people, I mean, I've heard this passage used like, for example, in some of the quote unquote early church fathers, I think it might be Barnabas. I could be wrong on that. So don't anybody quote me on that, but it's one of the early church fathers uses this text to, to say that, you know, he's, he's doing away with the, with the Sabbaths and the feasts and, and all of that. And then, of course, I've heard some in the, the Hebrew Roots community say, well, he's talking about your new moons and, and your Sabbaths, which are like pagan feasts and things like that. But I think if we slow down and look at the context, um, Yahweh is not condemning the rituals of the Israelites wholesale. He's condemning their emphasis on externals while they neglect uh, more weightier matters, some of them internal and, and some of them still external, like in regards to the taking care of widows and the taking care of fatherless children. And uh, that's why he says later in the text that your hands are, are full of blood. Peter, is that how you see that text or what's your understanding of Isaiah yeah, 1? Precisely. If, if we were to take the text the way the early church fathers that you mentioned referred to, I think Justin Martyr might be the earliest. I mean, maybe, maybe Barnabas as well, too. But I know Justin Marta uses this, and he uses this to say that God no longer accepts, that the Almighty, the Almighty no longer accepts the Sabbath, that he no longer accepts the observance of the commanded uh, times in, in, in the Torah. Mm -hmm. And uh, But if you take that literally, then it, it, the Almighty is also telling us not to pray, not to spread our hands in prayer. <laughs> um, and it, right, it wasn't a matter of, 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 of these things being bad. It was a matter of the right priority of ethics and justice and compassion. So exactly what you said there. Cool. Yeah, I'm glad we agree on that. So Peter and I, we were just talking before we hit the record button. We, we haven't rehearsed. We haven't talked about what we're going to talk about. I kind of like it like that, though. That way, you know, if Peter comes off with something that I haven't heard before, or maybe that we even disagree in a minute way on, we can kind of talk about it and go back and forth. So I, I, I welcome uh, courteous and cordial disagreement. I, I love that. Yeah, but I like when we can agree too, Peter. Yeah. <laughs> me too. <laughs> so let me start the stream here. I'm going to add Mr. Solberg to the stream. This is right after he talks about the rituals and he's going to get into the Sermon on the Mount. Let me make a point here too to our listeners that myself and, and Peter in no way, we're not doing this to try to demean Mr. Solberg. Uh, he seems like a very nice Christian gentleman. I have contacted him through email. I went to his website, got on his contact page, told him that I was responding to his video and, you know, told him I'd be more than willing to have a discussion um, on camera with him in regards to this. So I think that his, his understanding and um, 
way of viewing certain texts of scripture is incorrect. Uh, that has nothing to do with, with me uh, talking bad about him as a person. So I just wanted to kind of continue to make that disclaimer that I've mentioned in, in previous videos before we start here. All right, here we go. But rituals aren't the point of God's law. And so we see this pattern in Yeshua's teaching that, that transposes God's law from the external to the internal. It's probably most explicitly stated in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Peter, I got to stop here real quick. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you kind of see, he says, we see this pattern in Yeshua's teaching that transposes. And he, he in his early in his video, he mentioned transposing like uh, music. He's a musician. I'm a musician. I talked about that in my first video. But from the external to the internal. So it insinuates whether or not he directly says it here or not. I think we see this in some of his other videos as well, but it insinuates that God's law used to be external mm -hmm. and now it's internal. Right. Right. And I think that's a, that's a misunderstanding, right? I mean, you, the foundation is off right there at, at the beginning because God's law has always been both about the internal and the external. A text that comes to my mind is in Matthew 23, uh, which is arguably Yeshua's strongest rebuke um, of anyone. But there he's talking to a group of uh, scribes and Pharisees, and he says towards the latter portion of that chapter, first clean the inside of the cup that the outside may come clean as well. So there's the internal, internal to the external. I, I think it's interesting uh, that he uses the word ritual uh, throughout here. And um, the word ritual is often seen as a bad word, right? Uh, especially for, for those that have, for those that have that the Protestant Catholic, um, like polarity, right? Catholics do rituals, right? So rituals are dead works, right? And so to use that word ritual uh, is almost like a, it's almost setting the stage for a negative response. But mm -hmm. the fact is the, uh, the Almighty gave us ritual, right? Yes. The seventh day of the Sabbath is a, yes. a ritual, right? Yes. Uh, the new moon is a ritual. The, pa the Passover is a ritual. Um, we, we have unfortunately, because of some of these assumptions that you just said there about uh, how, you know, this heart versus mind thing, heart versus body thing, um, that we, we've, we've assumed that ritual means automatically that it's it, it has no spirit, right? That it has no spontaneity, that it has no heart intent, no no purpose, kavana we, we, we call it, no, no purpose or intent. But the, the fact is we can do ritual with full heart intent, and it's when the mm. heart intent isn't there and when we have the, you know, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Yeshua says, when you're bringing your animal to, as an offering at the altar, you're bringing your gift to an altar, yes. to the altar, right? He's affirming the altar there. Yeshua yes. is talking about worship at the Mizbeach, at the altar, right? And he says, if your brother has ought against you, then go make right with your brother. And then come bring your, your, your offering to the altar. He didn't say, don't come to the altar. Don't worry about that. Hmm. You know, pray in your heart. Uh, I'm, I mean, growing up, we, we'd be saying this song, uh, in my heart, I'm down on my knees, right? In mm. my heart, I'm worshiping you. And of course, we would sing that while standing up, while sitting down. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, It's a beautiful sentiment. And I, you know, I certainly value the fact that people want to be worshipful in their heart. But, you know, there's no reason why we have to separate <laughs> yeah. what we do in our heart and our heads from what we do with our bodies. So, I mean, brother, I mean, yeah. I think the word worship, I know in Hebrew, maybe even in Greek, but the word worship literally means, you know, uh, you're, you're prostrate with your face there to the ground. And so when you actually do the action, let's say you sing, you know, in my heart, I'm down on my knees, but you actually do the action. It's a it's an outward act of humility before the creator that you're saying, look, you are, you are mighty and I am not, and I'm mm -hmm. bowing down to you as a sign of respect. It's, it's no different than, you know, you meet, you meeting a, a very important person in the world today and you, you dress nice and you go to approach them and you approach them humbly. You know, you don't go in there chewing gum and smacking and throwing a curse word out here and there. <laughs> you approach them humbly. And uh, that's how we, 
it, it's okay to have that that ritual um, right. towards our Creator. Excellent point about the altar there um, yeah. in Matthew five, how that Yeshua is affirming there the worship uh, at the altar, the bringing the korban uh, mm -hmm. to to the altar, which in all likelihood probably there is uh, is uh, is an animal sacrifice, as mentioned in in Vayikra or Leviticus. Mm -hmm. All right, let's continue on. The Sermon on the Mount is found in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. And there's a very famous section of the sermon where Jesus issues a series of, you have heard it said, but I say to you statements. For example, he says, you have heard it said, meaning you have read it in the Torah, that you shall not commit adultery. Mm, Peter, okay. Um, and I may be stopping this more than I, I thought. But Let's go for it. <laughs> you have heard that it has been said. Yep. Um, maybe before we even, maybe before we even get to this, this part, um, uh, let's, let's comment a little bit on what, what I think is really the Shema of, of Yeshua's ministry. In other words, as Deuteronomy six, four through nine is to the Hebrew scriptures, I think Matthew five, 17 through 20 is, is to the ministry of, of Yeshua with his famous, do not think. I have come to destroy or to abolish the Torah or the Nevi'im, the law or the prophets. And then he says it again, I have not come to, to destroy or abolish, but to, to fulfill or, or establish, confirm um, uh, some translations of that word in the, in the King James version, even is to fully preach. I think in, in the book of Romans, the translators use fully preach. Um, so what do you think when Yeshua begins there, it kind of he's before he gets into the, you have heard that it's been said, but I say unto you in Matthew 5, 17, what's your understanding of, I have not come to abolish, but, but to fulfill. How do you view that? Yeah, it's, it's a very, it's a very strong statement. It's one of the strongest statements we have in Jewish literature about the, uh, the eternality of Torah. <laughs> quite, quite yes. honestly. Yes. Um, I, I, if and obviously you know as we keep reading those verses uh he goes into a very practical application of that you know if if he was if he was trying to say that i did not come to abolish but to fulfill as and to set the lay aside but then he goes on to say that whoever keeps and teaches others to do the least of these commandments shall be called greatest in the kingdom of the heavens the kingdom of yes. god and so obviously that 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 very practical application would not make sense if the the writer of Matthew or with, if Yeshua had in mind that the the commandments would have not been applied going forward. So the, 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 we see a very clear uh, affirmation of the Torah, and I, I think it is dangerous to to read what follows in a paradigm that tries to abolish the Torah or that lays it aside or that diminishes it because Yeshua lays as a groundwork, like a ground interpretive rule there that the Torah is being affirmed, being established, not being abolished. So yes. agree with that? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, I want to point out something I learned years ago. I've got the book here. This is by the author David Biven. Have you, yep. have you ever heard of this? Or you oh, may yeah. have it in your library. Yep, it's in my so, library. Yep. Yeah. So David Biven, I'll read from the back here. It says he's the founder and editor, Jerusalem Perspective in Jerusalem, Israel, a lifelong scholar of the Jewish background of the Gospels. Biven has spoken internationally on Jesus's cultural context for more than 25 years. He is a founding member of the Jerusalem School of Synoptic Research, a think tank of Christian and Jewish scholars who study the first century Jewish context of Jesus's life and teaching highly recommend for our viewers to pick up a copy of this book on Amazon. Uh, it's very inexpensive, but it's worth its weight in gold. And David Biven brings up in here, I learned this, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 years ago, but he brings up in the book how that the terminology um, among rabbis in the first century Jewish faith, which Yeshua wasn't the only rabbi. There were various rabbis with disciples uh, that existed there in the first century. Um, he said that they would discuss Torah and in their discussions, in their back and forth of the study of the Torah, if one of the rabbis said something that the other one disagreed with, they might would say in Hebrew, obviously, but they might would say something like, 
No, you have destroyed the Torah. You have abolished the Torah with that understanding. Let me tell you the proper way to understand that. Uh, likewise, if a rabbi would um, interpret the Torah properly and the rabbi sitting next to him, he liked that interpretation, that understanding, and he thought it was it squared with what the creator had initially intended and said, he would say, ah, you have fulfilled the Torah. And I think that that is a beautiful or, or the the way, but it is a beautiful way to understand what Yeshua is is driving at in his the rest of the fifth chapter of Matthew, where he has these. You've heard that it hath been said, but I say unto you. Now, Mr. Solberg said when Yeshua said, you've heard that it hath been said, he said, meaning it is written in the Torah. And I don't think that that's completely accurate because if Yeshua wants to say it is written, he says it is written. And we just have to back up one chapter in Matthew, Matthew chapter four, where he's having this disputation with the adversary. And, uh, you know, the devil says, if thou be the son of God, command these stones to turn into bread, uh, probably because he knew Yeshua had been fasting for 40 days. He was hungry. And Yeshua responded with the scripture from Devarim. He says, it is written. And then he quotes Devarim, what we call Devarim 8, verse 3. He doesn't say, you have heard that it has been said, right? So there's a reason why he says, you have heard that it has been said in this uh, first example that Mr. Solberg gives. Get, uh, comment on that a little bit, Peter. No, I think that's a very likely way to apply it and, and, and understand it. Yeah, I've, I'm familiar with that with that section in Biv. And in fact, I almost brought it today. I was, I was thinking about, about bringing that. Uh, I didn't do any preparation, but that was the one one thought I had was to bring that quote. So cool. I wanted to vet it in the sources. And I, m my guess is that the word for establish there is the word for stand, uh, omedet, um, to, to make firm the stand or koyom. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's probably the word that would have been used there by Yeshua as well in the, in, in the Aramaic or the Hebrew. Sure. Uh, to stand something, to establish something is most likely what he was what he was saying there. How do you understand verse 20? Um, of course, verse 19, I think verse 19 is pivotal where he says, uh, therefore, in other words, based upon what I've just said in verses 17 and 18, therefore, whosoever of you breaks the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so will be called least in the kingdom of of heaven but yeah. if you practice and do them you'll be called great in the kingdom of heaven so our our level of commandment keeping determines um our level uh, in the kingdom of heaven as, as i see verse 19 i do think that there's some leeway and the greek word there for break I, I don't really like the translation break but the greek word is luo and it can mean loosen and i i think that the best way to understand verse 19 is um, that sometimes we study Torah and we may loosen a commandment's uh, strictness um, and not not necessarily intending to, um, but that's how we see the commandment, but yet we loosen some of the, the smaller or the least of the commandments. And I think that that demotes our position in the kingdom of heaven, not that we won't be in the kingdom of heaven, but it can demote our, our position there. But if we practice and do them, in other words, if in our studies we get them them right and uh, we fulfill the Torah in our own lives, uh, then I think we'll be great in the kingdom of heaven. Um, that's my take on 19. I asked you about 20 and then I went into 19. <laughs> no, I, you know, I, I had forgotten about the word loosen there. That's a really, really good observation. And I, I think that's likely the, the, the best understanding. I mean, and, and that affirms further the Torah context here. You can loosen the commandment without breaking the commandment, right? Yeah. You can make a commandment too lenient, right? Um, yeah. And then, have the wrong priorities and how you apply it right uh you can loosen the commandment for one situation and then fail to make it you know to tighten it <laughs> for the future right mm -hmm. uh, there are situations where we have to loosen the commandments because sure. of, of human existence right um and then uh so i that 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 really situates the the, the passage very well within a torah context so that that's a really good observation so. Yeah, so, something else, too, and I know I asked you about 20, but I think that this is needed as well, because a lot of people I talk to in Christianity will say that, you know, well, Jesus fulfilled the law. We don't believe he, he abolished it, but he, he fulfilled it. And then, of course, when they continue on, you see that their their understanding of him fulfilling it means we don't have to do it anymore. <laughs> so he really abolished it through fulfilling it. But in the previous verses in Matthew uh, 5, 1 through 16, 
if you'll notice the context is not about Yeshua's obedience to the Torah. Now, I believe Yeshua was obedient to the Torah, but the context is him teaching the disciples, people that are listening to him and wanting to learn under his teaching. He says, um, you know, blessed are you when men shall revile you. Uh, blessed are the meek. Um, uh, blessed are the pure in heart. Uh, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Uh, let your light shine among men so that others see your good works. So it's all about people who are listening to him, their obedience. And then on the heels of that, he says, do not think that I came. Do not, do not think my purpose is to come and destroy the Torah through, through misinterpretation. I've not come to do that. I've come to show you properly how to walk it out. Uh, I think that's important that we see that. That's very good. I like that. Excellent. Yeah. So in verse 20, my initial question, he right. says in 20, unless your righteousness surpass or exceed the scribes and Pharisees, you will in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. How do you understand that verse? There is a really interesting tradition of translation in the New Testament from the Greek uh, diakousine or uh, it, it, it's often translated as, as righteousness. And the, the problem with that translation is that righteousness, again, within our cultural connotations, connotes the idea of acts of private piety, okay? Mm. Where the word is indistinguishable in both Hebrew uses and Greek uses from justice, okay? So, and I've not been, I've not been able to vet this story. It's, it's sort of apocryphal, but I've, I've heard it said that when the King James translators were translating the New Testament, and they came across this word for righteousness, the Ikusine, that they translated it as justice. And the mm -hmm. apocryphal story was that King James didn't like that because the word justice had public accountability. Uh, it had connotations of public accountability, right? Hmm. Righteousness is in the, the typical Christian Western tradition. I'm sorry, I keep referring to this, but this is very much a part of how we read the scriptures. In the Western tradition, righteousness, again, connotes the idea of acts of piety. Okay, you go into your prayer closet, you pray in private, you give money in private. You know, this acts of piety, okay, where justice is an act of public piety, okay? And so what, what, I, think, what, what I think is being referred to here is most likely, because Yeshua focuses so much on matters of justice throughout the book of Matthew, mm -hmm. uh, the priority of the commandments, you referred to Matthew 23, a, a chapter that's very rich in meaning that is very much informed by, by later Jewish writings. Uh, some of the, the disputes he was referring to there are very much evidenced uh, in, in the rabbinic writings, for example. But what Yeshua is, is giving a, a call, is a call, a prophetic call to justice and mercy uh, as, as foremost. And that's very clear throughout his, his teaching. And sometimes that's mistaken, like by Solberg, it appears to be mistaking this as a transposing of justice and mercy over ritual. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's the merger of the two. I mean, if if the the idea is that Yeshua rose from the dead, rose from the dead as a physical being, okay, then that's an affirmation of the importance of physicality. Okay? Mm, mm, we, good we, point. We can't walk away. Uh, the Christian tradition cannot walk away from, from ritual, okay, at the same time that it affirms the resurrection. Because it's, it's ritual is what we do with our bodies to match what happens in our spirit and our mind. So um, mm. I'll stop there for a second. Any thoughts on Matthew 520? Um, oh, man, I, this is why I wanted you on. So <laughs> those that was great. That was wonderful. I'm, I'm listening. I'm trying to understand. So. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that um, the matters of justice, it's interesting that in the remainder of Matthew chapter five, as we call it, mm -hmm. I think it's from verse 21 to verse 48. Mm -hmm. Everything that Yeshua talks about in his what's called in scholarship antitheses mm -hmm. is person to person, horizontal mitzvot. Mm -hmm. There's nothing there necessarily directly between the vertical between the, the worshiper and the creator. Mm -hmm. But it's rather, you know, um, the the command about uh, murder, the command about adultery, the command dealing with divorce, um, the command dealing with uh, taking oaths, which I guess that would be between the creator. I mm -hmm. didn't think about that one. Um, and then the final two would deal person to person again. Um, so that mostly that those would be matters of, of justice in, in that regard. 
And I guess you could even, you know, fit taking of oaths uh, and, and in there as well. Um, when he says exceed or surpass scribes and Pharisees, how do you understand that? Unless you're justice, yeah. let's say exceed or surpass. Yeah, and I appreciate I appreciate the question. And, and again, I would emphasize that the word justice should be used here versus righteousness. Okay. And I think it's important to understand how how, how radical the statement is. Mm-hmm. Who were the good guys on the playing field in the first century? Mm-hmm. Who were the the advocates of Bible study? Who were the advocates of personal Bible study? Who are the advocates of personal prayer and personal piety and living a, a life of devotion to to God? The Pharisees. Sure. The Pharisees. They were the ones that were trying to take the Torah away from the priestly aristocrats and bring it into the hands of the the, the plebeians of the of the common people. They were trying to raise the holiness, the kedusha of the common people, up to the level of the temple. Sometimes to a fault. They sometimes erred in that way. They were called parashim because they were separatists. They emphasized keeping holiness around the table, ritual cleanness around the table. Um, and But they were the good guys on the scene in the first century. And it's so important to understand how how true that is because it's so shocking when Yeshua says things like this. I mean, he's, he's taking the good people, okay? <laughs> and he's saying, unless your justice exceeds that, okay, then et cetera, or even in the book of Matthew. And of course, within the Pharisees, there was incredible diversity of opinion sure. and so on. And a lot of that gets recorded later. Um, in fact, what's fascinating with the New Testament, it often provides the earliest written documentation we have of some of these disputes that we don't know about until far later. So right, right. Uh, so I, I so I think the shock value here is huge. And the Sermon on the Mount does that. It does this shock value all throughout. And I think sometimes this shock value is used as a license to dismiss what's being compared. So I think that that's a trap that is fallen into with these, like Isaiah chapter one, shock value. Yes. Don't, don't pray. Don't pray to me anymore. <laughs> Don't do the Sabbath anymore, okay? Don't make the offerings anymore. Obviously, the Almighty wanted the prayers, wanted the Sabbaths, wanted the offerings, yes. but he wanted it done in a justice context. So the shock value is is it should not be canceling out what's there. Yes. Well, so Yeshua is, is affirming. I mean, he didn't focus on an obscure sect in the desert of Qumran. He focused mm-hmm. on the ones that were known to be the advocates they were basically the evangelicals of the day who were having mm. private Bible study, you know, own your, your walk with, with God. Okay. Don't trust it to the priests. Okay. <laughs> Which is like the Catholics. Okay. Own it, keep it. It's yours. Take it and grow with it. Right. And uh, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's like that. It's, it's radical. It's, it's, it's startling and it should be. And sometimes I think we've toned down how startling it is because, I'm sorry, I'm getting off on a tangent. I'll stop here. But yeah. sometimes we, we've we've toned it down because the Pharisees have become the, the, the perpetual bad guys. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that's a different discussion. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, it's good. I mean, I don't think that Yeshua would be telling you that you need to surpass somebody that wasn't living strictly. Mm-hmm. I think that's the, that's your point there. In other words, he's saying, look, look, unless you surpass these guys, the guys that everybody knows as the religious in the community, you'll in no wise enter the, the kingdom of heaven. I think we need to keep in mind too, and you you alluded to this, there's, um, I think in one particular book that I have, a uh, historical book on first century Judaism, there's different types of Pharisees. There's the school of Shimon, the school of Hillel. They didn't always agree on everything. And that some Pharisees did follow Yeshua. Uh, uh, the ones that we call Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea. Um, so, uh, Anyhow, that's 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 something to throw throw in there as well. So let's see what else he says here in this Sermon on the Mount section. Uh, he's talking about Matthew five twenty seven through twenty eight and the adultery clause. I mean, that's one of the big ten. And then he says, "But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart." So what's Jesus doing here? Is he abolishing the Torah command about adultery? No. Is he changing it? Not at all. Is he, is he elevating it and, and making it even more difficult to keep? Sure. I think we could say that. Mm, Peter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So um, I like that he says, no, he's not abolishing it. Um, but 
then at the end where he says, is he elevating it, making it more difficult to keep? Um, I have a problem with that. And the first thing that my mind goes to when I think about Yeshua saying, you know, whoever looks upon a woman to lust after her in his heart has already committed adultery. Obviously, he's not talking about you've committed the physical act, but he's saying you've committed it on the internal, right? Um, my mind goes, the first thing my mind goes to is the 10th commandment. The 10th commandment says, do not covet and, and your neighbors. And, and it lists several things that belong to your, to your male neighbor. And one of the things is do not covet your neighbor's wife. That's, Coveting is an internal uh, sin so that if, you know, if Peter and I are, you know, riding down the road and I see this, um, you know, beautiful homestead or whatever, and, and I lust or desire after that in a jealous way, and I'm, and I'm angry with my neighbors because they have it and I don't, that's a, that's a form of coveting something that belongs to my neighbor. And Peter may not ever even know that that took place in my mind and my heart. So this is a commandment that can only be broken on the internal. Um, now, obviously, it leads to external things. But what this shows in the 10th commandment in both Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, that Yeshua is not introducing any new law here in Matthew 5, 27 through 28. When he says, whosoever looketh upon a woman to, to lust after her in his in his heart. Is that kind of how you see that as well, Peter? Absolutely. I, I yeah, I, I completely agree. I don't see him elevating the, the Torah to what to anywhere it wasn't already. It, yeah. The Torah already 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 had this in it. <laughs> yes, yes. It's already inherent to the Torah, and that's uh, the re the regulation of desires and wants. And it, it's and it's no mistake that the, the command against coveting is the last commandment and it parallels the first commandment, which is to have no gods before me. And, and that's what happens when you have a heart of acquisitiveness where you're, you're trying to acquire what is not rightfully yours, you essentially put yourself in the position of idolatry. And it's been pointed out, sorry, that in the apostle Paul, that he, 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 he calls covetousness idolatry. And there's a reason for that because it goes right to the heart of the commandment. And so mm. there are multiple ways to unpack the the heart of the commandments and Yeshua is doing one of those ways here right now. That's a it's an impactful way. It's an important way. Now if now if however uh, you you do desire something in your heart that's not yours, uh, that's happening between you you and God. It's it's, it's happening between it's in, in your own heart. Uh, yeah. Now if adultery it, we know obviously it's punishable, right? In, uh, by means within a community, right? Sure. Uh, but if a person has a heart condition, uh, <laughs> unless there's action that follows it, it doesn't fall under the witness criteria, et cetera. So right. it's certainly, yes, it is It is a serious, serious offense, especially if fanned into, into flame and maintained. But it doesn't fall under the, the, the literal prohibition that can that can be uh, acted upon by, by a community. Correct. So, yeah. Yes, I think Yeshua is saying, look, this is where adultery begins. You know, nobody just um, immediately one minute is not committing adultery and then the next minute is. It's it's something that usually takes place over a period of time where there's uh, a lustful, um, uh, unholy desire for another man's wife. And then there's a friendship that's born and then inappropriate talk and things like that. And eventually it can lead to to adultery. And Yeshua is saying, look, uh, Cut that thing off. Nip that thing off right there in the heart uh, before it begins to, to wail up. Um, he's not, though, and I've gotten in trouble with some of my Christian friends by saying this. <laughs> I don't think he's equating heart adultery with physical adultery. And I asked my Christian male friends, I said, you know, if, if your wife came home tonight and told you that she was struggling with, with uh, lustful thoughts, adulterous thoughts in her mind, um, you could work through that. You could talk that over. But if she came to you tonight, it would be a whole nother ball game with her telling you that she acted upon those thoughts. Right. It'd be a whole nother situation. And you it, you alluded to that in the Torah, how that one is a one is not only a sin, but it is a crime in mm -hmm. in a in a community of, of uh, Israel people. Um, the other is is a sin and it's it's serious. Uh, but it can't be punished by by death or or anything like that because it's 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 been kept on the inside. It's something that we need to deal with, um, and and that's what Yeshua is saying. So he's kind of, would you say he's kind of 
he's kind of peeling back a layer of the Torah here that might have been forgotten by some in the first century where that they were, they were obeying the, the literalness of the command to not physically lay with their neighbor's wife. Um, but maybe they were not placing the emphasis on lusting after their neighbor's wife. Anymore. Sure. It, it's a reminder that, that every individual needs um, a frequent basis. So, I mean, at any point in history, this could have been said and it still applies. <laughs> sure, sure. So I, I think sometimes we uh, focus on the, the errors that were occurring. Well, I think this is always relevant. You know, it's always relevant. <laughs> yeah. Do you think, too, I heard one uh, guy I was talking to one time. He said that uh, it may have been the view among some in first century Judaism that um, any time lust took place, uh, it usually fell on the blame of the woman um, and that Yeshua may have been challenging that in that obviously we believe women should dress modestly and men should as well. Um, but there may have been men uh, in the community that any time it was found out that they had been lusting, they automatically tried to justify themselves and turn it right back around on, on the woman. Well, she wasn't covered properly or she wasn't wearing this or wearing that. And Yeshua may have been challenging that understanding. What do you think about that? That's a great thought. And I like that thought because we see that even today. How often do we see people blaming um, blaming others for their own, their own, you know, we have to own our own, <laughs> our own offenses, right? Yeah. And yeah. we can blame, I mean, I see this in Christian communities and Jewish communities, uh, the idea that the, the, uh, the, that the, that modesty uh, somehow is the only source of, of lustful thoughts. And therefore, it's all the responsibility of the woman to control man's thoughts. No, mm -hmm. man, you're responsible for controlling your thoughts. Whether or not the woman is dressed modestly or not, you are responsible for controlling your own thoughts. That's a good thought to your action. I like that because it does go against that abuse. Yes. The abuse puts it all... I mean, we <laughs> we own our own behaviors, right? That's what that's what it means to be an adult, okay? But when we transfer the blame to somebody else, uh, that becomes an abuse. And I think that's a good good point here with this. I could see that being being very relevant and again, even today. So I mean, I mean, all right. Let's get back to it. The last thing he said was he believed that Jesus elevated the law to its strictness. Let's uh, remind our minds of that. And Peter and I are saying, no, we, we don't agree with that. Um, I don't think Yeshua added any new law in, in Matthew 5. I think he's just peeling back layers of Torah that people, uh, some people in the community had neglected. Um, let's see what he says uh, next. But more importantly, he's locating it in its ultimate setting, the human heart. He's reframing the Torah command from the external physical act of adultery, which of course is still wrong, Hmm. to the inward heart act of lust, which is at the root of adultery. He does the same thing with murder. Okay, before we go on to murder, Peter, mm -hmm. it's uh, he, he makes a great point here, um, and I think we need to keep it in mind that he says, I, I don't like the terminology he says about elevating, but he does point out how that just because um, Yeshua is focusing on um, the internal, uh, he is not negating the external. He said, um, he speaks of the physical act of adultery still being wrong. And this is important. Brothers and sisters, listen, this is important because this is foundational for the rest of the antitheses in Matthew 5. So whenever he says, you've heard that, that hath been said, and he quotes a portion from the Torah, he's never negating the, the letter of the law. Sometimes we, we use that phrase, letter of the law is some kind of uh, bad negative phrase but the letter of the law do not commit adultery still stands um, even though yeshua is saying but i say unto you spirit or intent of the law and spirit of the law is not some kind of esoteric thing floating around that we can't you know grab a hold to spirit of the law oftentimes means the intention the purpose uh the meaning of, of the torah in that regard it's very important that we understand Solberg agrees the letter of the law is not being abolished here in this text. You point out that all the uh, the antithesis, antithesis here with Yeshua mm -hmm. relate to interpersonal relationships, right? They all relate to how we relate to our neighbor, right? Even the oaths has to, has to do with interpersonal mm -hmm. relationships, right? Um, and what's fascinating with that is when you look at 
when you look at what, you, at what Yeshua is teaching here, for example, he talks about uh, turning the other cheek, for example, okay? Uh, when, when you run a society, if you're running a nation by, by Torah, it, it's worth noting here that, that a, lot of these, a lot of these teachings are calling for, uh, are calling for, how do I say it? <laughs> calling for behaviors, ethical behaviors that may or may not be called for in every situation. There, there are times when we don't turn the, the when, when we don't turn the other cheek, right? There are times when we have to take up a defense um, <clears throat> within Torah, okay? Uh, within torts, within, within Torah law, within courts and so on. Um, so it, it's it's worth noting that you, the placement of, of, of these values, what we call midoth and, and values, yeah. um, <clears throat> within Torah, are not necessarily the same thing as the application of how we apply Torah as a nation. This is really very much discussing interpersonal relationships. So, for example, somebody somebody wrongs me, I could take them to court. I could sue them for the money they owe me. Okay, or you know, I could I could forgive them in the right situation so it's it's essentially like yeshua is is calling for a higher level of compassion and justice right uh but he's not negating the fact that you can still sue somebody for 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 harm for damages okay so it's i'm not quite sure how to explain that uh but it it does appear to be happening here that yeshua is you know he's, he's affirming that, that these systems exist but here's a way that you can you can fine-tune your your interpersonal behaviors okay yes Right, if that makes sense. No, it makes it makes all the sense in the world, um, especially, and I'm going from memory here. I don't have my Bible in front of me, but I think it's like maybe verses 38 to 42 where he sit, he speaks of um, not taking revenge mm -hmm. upon people. You, you've heard that it's been said, uh, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And, of course, the, the modern Christian understanding is, see, he's doing away with the eye for eye and tooth for tooth, what's called the right. lex talionis, you know, the law of the talent. Um, but eye for eye and tooth for tooth is a righteous, just, uh, judgment. It, it's, it's mentioned, I'm teaching on Exodus 21 right now, and I'm, I'm up to verse, I think it's verse 25 in that text where it mentions eye for eye and tooth for a tooth right after it talks about how that two men get in a fight and one of them hit a pregnant woman so that her child goes forth. Um, if there's any mischief that follows, I think it's a reference, uh, to, the, the pregnant woman and uh, the baby that's growing inside of her there. I agree. Um, but he says, eye for eye and tooth for a tooth as the who shall determine the judges mm -hmm. as the judges shall determine. So what Yeshua is saying in, in Matthew 5, 38 through 42 is you need to keep this standard um, as, as the, as the Sanhedrin, as the judges determine in the community, but on day to day interaction in light matters where that, you know, somebody at the, at the, the local market, you know, may, you know, uh, give you the finger, so to speak, or say a harsh word, you don't respond back in kind in these day-to-day -day light matters. And those are the matters, let's face it, those are the matters that we face most of the time. Most of the time, we don't have criminal activity performed upon us. Uh, most of the time, it's just light matters. Um, like in in Luke, I think it's Luke 17, in Luke's gospel, Yeshua says that, uh, and I'll use me and Peter, he says if me and Peter are are working together that day and um, I sin against Peter, and if I turn and repent, uh, after Peter rebukes me for my sin, Peter has to forgive me. And then he says if you sin against your brother seven times in one day, and he turns and says, I repent, he must forgive you. Okay, that has to be talking about light matters, brothers and sisters. <laughs> it's not saying if I if I steal Peter's wallet one time and then repent and I keep stealing his wallet seven times. <laughs> and it's definitely not talking about if I murder him or cause physical bodily harm on him. It's light matters. And people just read these things and they don't they they forget that Yeshua is you know, he's a member of the Yehudim. <laughs> he's, he's not saying on the heavy matters or the weightier matters of, of the Torah. He's not saying you can't go before the Sanhedrin and get a, a, a just judgment pronounced upon somebody that, you know, caused a fight with you and then accidentally, you know, killed a pregnant woman in the midst of the fight. Um, that, that's very important. Uh, I like, I'm glad you said that because it, it triggered that thought um, in my mind there. No, that, that was perfect. And you unpacked that perfectly in a way that my mind wasn't able to at the moment. I actually, do you mind if I bring us back to a verse that we passed over, Matthew 5, 22? Sure. It's really interesting here. Matthew 5, 22, 
a number of times in the book of Matthew, uh, Yeshua refers to the escalation of justice matters, right? First, you, you, you bring, to, you know, two witnesses, which is a court of two or three, and then you bring it to the, the, the council, okay? And there's something happening here in Matthew 5.22 that just dovetails perfectly with what you're saying. And I want to point it out. It's Matthew 5.22. Moreover, I say unto you that whosoever is angry, angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Okay. It goes on to say here, and whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. The Greek there is Sanhedrin. Mm -hmm. But whoever shall say that you fool shall be in danger of Gehenna or the, the, the destruction, the hellfire. Mm -hmm. So you see judgment, you see councils, there's Sanhedrin, and you see uh, uh, Gehenna. Okay. And hold my fingers up correctly there, okay? Um, the, the reference to judgment is actually, this is referring to the escalation process. The judgment is a court of three, okay? And the, the Sanhedrin is a court of 23, which is the minimum required, required size court to execute matters of, of capital cases, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then it goes on from there to say, uh, if it goes further, then, it, then, then the justice is God's. Basically, it's saying, that, you know, yes, there's justice here in this earth. There's, there's the, the the court of three, the court of 23, the, the, the Sanhedrin, which can carry out a capital case. And then you have Gehenna. Basically, that's when God is, is going to judge. And there are matters of justice that we can't we can't achieve. The majority of, majority of matters of justice are not settled here in this age. They're, they're settled with, with the Almighty. Um, mm -hmm. But part of what's significant here, too, is that, I mean, he's obviously using hyperbolic language. You know, if I call my brother, if I'm angry with my brother, I can't be brought to um, to a court of three to be tried. Uh, it's 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 speaking hyper, hyper with hyperbole. Um, now, if I act out against my brother, then yes, I can be brought to it to a court of three or twenty three, etc. Um, I wanted to point that out because of justice matters. The issue was teaching very clearly that we are to trust justice matters ultimately to the Almighty and Gehenna. Is one of the places in which justice is settled, unfortunately, ultimately for for, for many. Um, but and that is even though we have a, a justice system that was given to us by Torah, uh, that does not settle all matters of justice. That's um, right. So sorry that that dovetails with what you were saying there. I see this theme uh, developing more in the Sermon on the Mount here as we're talking about this. Uh, so I wanted to point that out before I forgot it. So thank you. That's, yeah. Excellent, Peter. Excellent. Okay. So we'll move back to Mr. Solberg here. See what he says. I think he's about to get into Matthew 5, 21 through 22, oh. as you mentioned murder. So let's see what he says about that. Awesome. Elevating it from the physical act of taking someone's life to the internal heart disposition of anger. Throughout his ministry, he teaches the same things about greed and swearing oaths and divorce and, and other topics. And we're going to look at a few more examples in a minute. But the point is that under the New Covenant, the mosaic ceremonies and rituals have graduated from the, from the outer physical world to the internal spiritual world of our hearts, just like God promised. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. This is why we find this pattern throughout Yeshua's teachings. Oh, Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. And we love you, Mr. Soberg. It's just, it's, it's, well, um, you know, you know, the reality is I, th I think he's better than this. I, he's a yeah. thinker. He's an academic. I think he's better than, than, than this, uh, what, what he just said there. Um, I, I don't know why he's so, he's so, uh, beholden to this, this paradigm of thinking about uh, law and spirit and so on. It, I'm surprised because I know, I know he's, he's well studied. Sure. Uh, he knows a good deal about Judaism. And uh, I mean, he must know that in Judaism that we see spirit and, 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 and heart, you know, spirit and faith. I mean, uh, mind and matter are, are combined. The ritual and faith are combined. You know, we don't see that as a separate course. Mm -hmm. And he, he must be aware of the fact that he's speaking from a very particular cultural setting. Roman Catholics wouldn't agree with him, right? And they also they also affirm the, the, these passages. Roman Catholics who wouldn't agree that there's a separation between, you know, spirit and, and matter and all that. I'm, I'm surprised that he is so beholden to this model. Because, again, I think he is he's better than this and he can think better than this. So, uh, anyway, I'll let you speak for, for a moment there. Yeah, agreed. And um, 
I'm saddened by the the way in which the new covenant was was brought up. Um, because if if we're students of of Hebrew scripture, obviously we know new covenant doesn't come about in Hebrews eight. It's mentioned in Hebrews eight, but the author of Hebrews is quoting Jeremiah, Jeremiah thirty one. And then Jeremiah 32 continues, New Covenant promises. Jeremiah 33, there's more New Covenant promises um, about the world to come. And the same thing in Ezekiel 36 and 37. And a huge part of the New Covenant is the Torah written upon the the hearts and minds of the house of Israel and and the house of Judah. Catch this, people. It's very important because in modern Christianity, they flip this and it sounds good. It's, it's almost like a subliminal message. And I'm not saying that everybody is intending to, to thwart the prophecy, but they, they teach this as though now in Christianity, your heart is the law rather than the, the actual prophecy saying the law is written on your heart. The same thing written on stone or in the book of the law uh, by Moshe instead of that actually being written on your heart <laughs> and you wanting to to obey it out of a out of a get to out of a desire to to you know to fulfill the torah they think that you just walk around and you kind of just feel is this wrong is that wrong is this right is that right and that that's not the new covenant promise it 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 it's not that your heart is the law it's that the law is being written i don't even think it's come to completion yet but it is is being written on on your heart and your mind and the part, another part of that new covenant is, is the restoration of the land of Israel, um, the restoration of the, the Aaronic uh, priesthood and, and the Davidic king. Um, I mean, all of this is the promise of, of the new covenant. And it takes place um, in, its, in its finality, in its total culmination um, at, at the resurrection of the dead. Um, in the world to come, the first stage of the kingdom, what's, what sometimes is called the millennium or the 1,000 years, and then the finality of the new heavens and, and the new earth. This is the new covenant that was promised uh, to to all 12 tribes of, of Israel. And it's, it's disappointing that the new covenant is just brushed over as though what's what's the purpose of the new covenant somehow is now it's about heart adultery and heart murder. And it used to just be about physical adultery and physical murder. That, that, that saddens me. It, it, it diminishes the, the significance of the commandments too, to make them simply a matter of, of outward rote uh, versus matters of spirit. Um, I mean, the same God uh, that he believes in uh, gave, gave the Torah, right? <laughs> yeah. So if he believes that, then, then does he think God was just speaking about, about shallow ritual, about outward expression. No, I mean, he, he would know from the beginning that it was always about the heart. I mean, the, yes. we're told in the, in the Torah to circumcise the foreskin of our hearts. Right. And we know with the merger of spirit and matter that in Ezekiel's temple and the, in, in the, in the time to come, uh, that the people that worship there will be circumcised yes. in heart and in flesh, okay? Yes. Heart and flesh. And uh, we need both. <laughs> Amen. Necessary. It's not simply just a matter of, of being circumcised in the heart, and as though that somehow undoes uh, any requirement to do anything physically. Uh, it's Amen. The merger of both of both realities. It always was, always has been, and as you pointed out with Jeremiah thirty-one and all the Jeremiah passages, yeah. and Ezekiel, uh, I shall pour out my spirit upon them, and they shall keep my statutes, my huchim. And my judgments, my mishpat team. Okay, yes. the expectation is that the the giving of the spirit, the the, the new covenant, in its fullness, will be uh, evidenced by the observance of the Torah, which Jeremiah thirty one says, "I will put in your heart." Right? Amen. <laughs> Amen. So, if if you're walking in the spirit now, brothers and sisters, it that doesn't mean your life is divorced from the Torah. Walking in the spirit, even if it's just the down payment of the spirit or the earnest money that we have right now, um, as as uh, Paul puts it in in Ephesians and maybe I think maybe in Colossians, um, the spirit walk is is contrasted with the flesh walk and that the spirit walk is is an obedient walk. <laughs> Romans eight talks about this. I think Galatians five talks about this, the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the spirit. And if you look at the fruit of the Spirit, at the end of the list, Paul says, against such things, there is no law. So there's no law against love and joy and peace and patience and, and things like that. So we can't divorce the Spirit walk from, from uh, 
um, at an actual both out outward and and inward um, obedience uh, to to the law that Yahweh gave through Prophet Moshe. Uh, let's continue. He was preparing us for the new covenant that would be inaugurated in his blood. And this is why, following his resurrection, the rest of the New Testament writers could write what they did. The new covenant had begun, and God's law, his Torah, his instruction, had been transposed hmm. from physical outward acts to spiritual inward attitudes. Let's look at some examples. So, Peter, we probably won't have time to get to his examples uh, in this session. Hopefully we can finish this back up. Um, any comments that you that you have? I mean, I got a ton, but any comments that you have about what he just said there? Um, I mean, I would default back to what I said. I'm I'm, I'm surprised that he's 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 in this dichotomy, this polarity with spirit and matter, and uh, you know, ritual versus versus principles and so on. But go ahead, I'd, I'd like to hear your your thoughts. I agree with you. I think um, I think we've we've already responded to to kind of how he summarized everything. I was just thinking as he was talking, you know. We say the Shema around here in my in my home and in our congregation. We we recite it every every Shabbat, um, every new moon, and part of the Shema is these words I am giving you today are to be in your heart. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, this is this is this is Torah. It's never been divorced from the internal. And of course, the heart, you know, being the seat of emotions, not the necessarily the physical organ that pumps the blood, but but meaning that. You, you've got to feel it from that that inner inner man, that inner person, the, the depths. So so that you don't it's not that you don't steal because you're just afraid that a cop will catch you. <laughs> it's, it's you don't steal because I love Peter and I, or I love my neighbor. That's why I don't want to steal from him. I don't want to lust after my neighbor's wife, not because I'm worried I'll get caught, but because I, I don't want to disobey the creator and i don't want to you know to do that to my to my neighbor um you know so in in a sense mr soberg is is correct in that he is getting us to focus on the heart of the matter um the problem is is that he's he's kind of getting us to to shove the the physicality or the letter of the law um um, to the side and i think that's probably what he's about to do uh, with some of these examples he's about to bring up. So, but that'll have to wait until next time. <laughs> so until next time. And I, I appreciate that. And I think, it, you know, it, it's almost as though he, you brought the example up early with the church fathers in Isaiah chapter one. It's almost as like, as though he's fallen into the same trap, right? If he were to expound, expound on Isaiah one, would he use the same, would he come, would he come to the same results? Mm. Um, I mean, Excellent point. you know, um, He's fallen into the same pattern, the same trap, and it's it's an unfortunate outcome there. It would be interesting to see his exegesis on Isaiah 1. And you know what? I kind of think he, he would exegete that correctly. I really do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but Peter, I appreciate you taking your time. Hopefully we can uh, schedule another session and continue to go through this. Um, I hope so. Um, I knew that you would add a blessed bonus to this video series and... Uh, and I don't, I don't think that you disappointed, brother. I think you brought up several good points today. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon.